Hi, and welcome to the fourth episode of Keen Minds. I am Jen, a.k.a. Takata Saiko. And I am Tessa. And we're going to be discussing the fourth episode of the fourth season, which was Gaia. We're going to talk a little bit about the characters, and we've got quite a few parallels. Uh, For those of you that have not listened to us before, we are a podcast that focuses in on Tom and Liz Keen and how the characters relate to them, the task force, Red, Red's team, etc., etc., we tend to focus in on the Keens because we found that, that other podcasts don't tend to focus on them quite as much. I mean, Liz, yes, but not as much on Tom. And, and so, we love the Keens. And we do love the Keens. We love the Keens separately and together. And, you know, some of us prefer them together. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a shipper. I, I would like to get that out there right away. I feel like it's a, a you know, a confession there. I am a Keen Squared shipper. I am also, feel like I should say, a Sar- uh, Saram shipper. <laughs> after this episode (laughs) so my heart's still in pieces on the floor I'm finding small fragments as the day goes on (laughs) and I am not a shipper I am a theorist and I'm uh, interested in finding and reconstructing the puzzle that the blacklist is uh, a three-dimensional probably more dimensional puzzle but we both love the kings we love every single character of the blacklist so no hate here we all love Absolutely. The the writers and the production team and everybody works so hard, and the actors definitely, work so hard to give us such layered, deep characters. There's there's not a flat character on this team. There's not one person on there that doesn't have a deep, deep storyline going. Whether they get half of the, the screen time on there or if they get just a couple minutes, every one of them takes it and brings their A game every time. So yes. we love them. Outstanding job on, on the actors, the directors, and the, and the writing team, as well as the, as the production and post-production. And uh, so let's jump in first with, uh, should we start with Samar and Aram, get yeah. that out of there? Because everybody is shocked and, and, uh, and puzzled, and some people are cheering for Aram. Well, others are very sad about Samar. Um, So let's take it. If I start crying, don't judge me. Samar and Aram in this episode. It was very interesting because I'm pretty sure we've never seen Aram actually snap at anybody before. And it was very much a pause and am I going to do this? Oh, what the hell? I'm going to do this. I I wonder, um, Samar has not been herself ever since, really ever since the... um, uh, Saul bin Hassan. Ever since her brother got killed, or she gave her brother to Red to get killed, and she realized the extent that her whole life has had been a, a basically a, a, a myth. It's something that that didn't happen. You know, she devoted her life to avenging that brother, and uh, that's what she had. And then she gave that up for Liz. Then Liz turned out to have fake her death. And I think that that was the only thing holding up. And that explains a lot why she was so much into like a baby shower. Like Liz was like a, 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 an alternative life for her, I feel. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's one reason she's taken it so hard. We, we have a Rom who is, I feel like on a grand scale, kind of, and often, not just here, but in a lot of ways, the general audience's reaction tends to be the same as Aram's is showing on on screen. And he had the reaction of, I hate what you did, but I don't hate you, Liz. He had that that very much, I understand it, but that doesn't mean I'm okay with it sort of reaction. Samar is just, I mean, she's yeah, angry, she's bitter, and, and I, I don't blame her in the scope of of looking at what she gave up for Liz. It's something she's going to have to work through, and suddenly... She's finding herself very, very alone. She mm. she told everyone, hey, I'm putting in my resignation. No one even seems to blink at it. She calls Aram. I need some help on this. Oh, goodness, we're finding out that Aram has a girlfriend over there. That's awkward. She sends it in, and when she tells Aram the next day, hey, this is what I was talking to you about, and he congratulates her on it, I think it was a real blow, blow to her that... She was like, they don't want me here. They don't she care. She has no identity anymore. It, it's, it, it, yeah, it's like she's not, she's unwanted. She probably feels used. She feels used by everybody. And, and I think in a way, I don't know, 
that, that a lot of people pay. There was a little phrase by by Samar when, you know, she was talking to Liz and she finds out that her ex is getting married. She says, it's just that I don't know what I'm doing. She had just told Liz, you know, oh, I want a career. I don't want children. I always thought that there was a little something more there than that was just the truth. That in a way, she may have wanted to have everything like everybody wants. And, and I think she, she part of that is the fact that she had to grow up so quickly. She raised her brother. You know, at maybe 14, 15, when her parents died, she suddenly became the adult in the household. She was suddenly raising her, her little brother and raised him into adulthood. And so she wasn't just close to him as a sibling. She was a surrogate mother for him in a lot of ways. And I could imagine that, especially in the wake of everything that happened and going, where did I go wrong in that her younger brother that she raised became a terrorist? I mean, because that's a typical human reaction, even if it has nothing to do with the way she she raised him. And I'm not saying at all that it would have. I mean, those were his decisions and hardly Samar's fault. We've seen that she's very, you know, has a... A pretty solid, you know. Yeah, that's what we were taken in by a relative because in uh, in very yeah, conservative but, Iran. Um, but but yes, I mean, she had that responsibility. She seemed that she failed. Um, she had this affair with with a uh, wrestler. Wrestler told her that she she thought he shouldn't be in there, and now it's Aram telling her congratulations. Um, she's, you know, that, I uh, put in my resignation was a cry for, you know, let's come over here and have a talk with me. I am hurting. Absolutely. Uh, and it's almost like nobody, it, it was almost like screaming into a void and nobody's hearing her. Everyone's focused on Agnes, which makes sense. And it's also this point, and it's really interesting because it's, <laughs> I know it's early for parallels, but since we're talking about Samar. I saw a parallel today between Samar and Tom right now, which is, it makes sense because they have very similar backgrounds in in their training and such. But you have two people that are just expected to be strong, that are probably not great with handling their own emotions. They have spent a great deal of time under masks and under other identities and just doing the job. And suddenly they're both forced into these really horrible situations and strong personal emotions and they don't have anybody to lean on. And the people that they might have thought that they had to lean on aren't, aren't sticking around for them. With Samar, she, everyone just thinks Samar is strong. She's going to be strong. She has been strong. It, she's going to continue being strong. And yet she's trying to cry out for someone to help her out. And nobody seems to understand that that's what it is. Yeah, being strong doesn't mean that you don't have no emotions or not. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And no concept of uh, being in need. I mean, everybody who's strong doesn't mean that you don't occasionally need help in, in, a, in a hand just to talk, just to say, I'm important. I, I value what you did for me. You know, Liz, Liz should have just gone and have a conversation. But Liz is focused on her child, which is perfectly natural. And so everybody else had to take a back, back step. And I don't think Samar had anything left in her to hold on to a a better time. I think that's an excellent way to put it. She's just spent. She is absolutely spent. And the one person that she thought she could rely on, who has always been willing to call her on her her missteps and yet be a shoulder to cry on when she needs it. I mean, Aram has been there for her to, to lean on whenever she needs it. And to have him be the one that says, you know, I mean, and I do think that, he was speaking out of hurt as well because that that last scene between them when she said she popped off about the girlfriend and said she didn't care about the girlfriend and then he told her that he was happy to see her go and just the whole thing was I remember watching going wow they're like two children really just talk it out guys but they're both well, just I don't so know. hurt so see, I, I I saw a lot more than than uh, than them behaving like children I saw a very uh, a very interesting dynamic there. I saw Samar made a call that for Samar made perfect sense. It makes perfect sense for me. I wouldn't have no problem putting that push that button and killing that guy because it would say it would mean saving more than him. It doesn't matter if it's two people or three people or five yeah. million or 15 million. You're saving that guy was intending to kill them and you're saving them by killing this guy. 
that's a no-brainer for me. But I understand that there are other people that have a different view on, on, on the subject. They're conscientious objectors for reasons. And that, you know, that wasn't Aram's job. That correctly was um, Cooper's job. Yes, And he absolutely. didn't call it. And just to touch on that, with Cooper and Aram, to me, that showed excellent leadership from Cooper. I mean, they, they've mentioned and they've talked about on the show how Cooper is, you know, revered as this great leader. And that just highlighted it right there in that moment that he didn't pause. It just, it was his responsibility. He did not want that to be on Aram's conscious, reached over, pushed the button, and it was done. And yep. he made that hard call. And it is. It's an incredibly hard call. I mean, it's not one that I would like to make personally. Some people have to make those calls. I mean, that's, yes. if someone's going to kill a bunch of people, sometimes you have to make that hard call. Yeah. And and I I think that, that what Samar is forgetting is that this is a Ram, and that's what makes a Ram a Ram. Mm-hmm. He's not a tactical uh, team person. He's a hacker. He is a... Uh, NSA analyst, he can get and he can perform badass stuff in the technical world. He is not made to do this kind of decisions. Uh, so for Samar to to berate him for it felt very um, uh, uncalled for. And I think that Samar was just jealous. Samar realized that that she actually liked the Ram and the Ram had moved on. Well, I think she she knows that she missed it, and so. To her, she, she missed that opportunity. She never, I mean, I don't think that she thought she was going to. Just, you know, whenever, if and when she ever decided that Aram was worthy of her, he was going to be there. And suddenly he wasn't, and she realizes her entire life has just sort of imploding. And and I don't say this negative negatively towards Samar at all. She was just caught up. It's, it's like yeah. that was her, she had a life plan, and the life plan, the life plan implied that that she was a terrorist catcher. She was catching bad guys. And when the reason for being that collapsed, her whole self collapsed. It's like suddenly you realize you you base, maybe what you're doing is correct and right for you, but the reasons why you did it are wrong. Now you have to reevaluate. And I don't think she had had the time to do this. This being in the task force, which is what she said, you don't know who you're going to count on. And it's true. She didn't expect wrestler. She may have expected wrestler to to um, to fire her or reprimand her. But I think that she expected wrestler to understand that she was before everything trying to keep Liz alive. And I don't think wrestler understood that. So she got hurt there. Then she got hurt again by wrestler when he told her that he made no such attempt to take her, get her back. And that has to be tremendously hurtful for her. And then, you know, she's, 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 Aram gets a job back. Now she's in, indebted to Aram, which makes having a relationship pretty difficult, actually, for a person like Samar. Oh, absolutely. That, we were talking about wrestler. That leads into, into what wrestler did this episode, which was, it was interesting. I've seen varied responses to it on, uh, on Tumblr today. And, I've been kind of iffy, my <laughs> my ex kits on the fritz, so I've been iffy about what I'm, how how deeply mm-hmm. I'm searching into Tumblr without my ability to blacklist certain <laughs> certain tags mm-hmm. over there. <laughs> but wrestler's reaction, I it was really interesting because I almost feel like at some point in there, he decided, you know what, Samar is really good, and I do really trust Samar, and that would have sucked for her to. For, for, you know, it to have gone through that she got fired, you know, for her to have been gone. And now I think, and I don't know when that point was that he decided that, but I think that her leaving at this point really does bother him. And because I don't think he would have put himself out there and said, if there's anything I can do to convince you to stay, I don't think that was just a polite statement. That was as close to an apology yeah. as, he was, as he was willing to, to say that was him telling him, you know, you, you do, you, you should be here. And the funny thing is she was telling him exactly what he told her. Oh, absolutely. It was very interesting. The dynamic was, was fascinating. Wrestler measures the world in terms of the Reddingtons and the not Reddingtons. And, and, and she was an, an, a Reddington, so therefore, you know, she didn't want it. Therefore, Samar, I think, not trusting people means you don't, you're not ready to support me when I need it. 
So they were talking about similar ways, but they were not talking about the same thing. Uh, just the whole situation with Samar, it's, and that's, that's interesting that our entire character development here for this episode is centered around Samar, because so much was for this episode. It, she was really that secondary arc in the episode besides the mm-hmm. search for Agnes. And well, I, I thought that, that one one very interesting thing about the wrestler, what are people saying about wrestler? Because I found wrestler uh, reaction in everything to be completely consistent with with what my idea of, of wrestler has been. Oh, I've seen all over the board. I really have. And um, like I said, I haven't dug too deeply today just because, you know, busy at the work office and and everything mm-hmm. else and just not wanting <laughs> I, I'm a Keen Squared shipper. It was not a good episode for Keen Squared shippers. So <laughs> I'm very careful about how deeply I dig after those episodes. <laughs> Regardless, if you're looking for, for wrestler or whatever, you're going to find the hate. Um, mm. <laughs> and it was not a good day for that. Um, but no, just, just that it was... The, the gist of what I was seeing was that it was bizarre that he was the one that fired her, that told her she wasn't really welcome there, that he didn't trust her, and that it turned around on its head. And like you just said, I, I am in 100% agreement. I think that was his his apology right there. I think that's as close as you're going to get. And that's and for wrestler, it is an apology. I mean, some people are never going to say, I'm sorry, but they're going to spell it out for you in their own way. And that doesn't make it any less of an apology it doesn't make it any any less it doesn't lessen the weight at all that meant a lot coming from wrestler it really did because like we've talked about before the job's everything to rest i mean he he loves the job and to say i want you you're a good partner i want you here if i can convince you to stay he had to admit that yeah and I, i think that 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 for for wrestler was a very different perspective now back you know right where he said that I don't think he should have get the job back he was he had been the boss he had been the responsibility and those are that responsibility doesn't sit easy on his shoulder that's not who he is being the boss and being in Cooper's position requires you to make compromises to look grace to live in grace to go and talk politics and be able to to bend rules that's what you know. It's being a it, it's being a leader, and I don't think that that kind of leadership is it would be something that Russell would even want to do. Oh, I agree. I agree. He's he is a soldier. He takes the orders and he does it to a degree, at least. I mean, he does have his own set of morality, as we saw in the uh, in the Esteban episode, where he you know basically committed treason. Um, but he does have his own sense of morality that he follows, but. In general, with the people that he trusts, like Cooper, I mean, because Cooper was totally fine with that that reaction that that wrestler yeah. had because he defended him to Panabaker, and but Re- wrestler follows orders from people that he respects. I think is what it really boils down to. If he respects the person, if he's willing to follow behind the person, then he's going to follow those orders. And like you said, get, you know, making those hard hard calls. And being the person giving them, that's just not his place. And that's fine. Exactly. Um, which take us to, well, we touched on Cooper and Aram already. Mm-hmm. And um, and Cooper had been, like, barking orders. He had been, Cooper is also, in. he's going to have a conversation with Liz. And she, he's going to have a conversation, I think, with everybody. Because I think this has been hard on Cooper as well. Oh, I know it has. I mean, because you've got Charlene. We don't know what's going on with Charlene. Last we saw them in season three, he was dropping her off at the house and said, you know, she offered to let him come inside. And he said, no, but let's have dinner again tomorrow. We have no idea. He may be sleeping. In, well, I mean, it's only been a week, maybe. Not even. I mean, I mean, it's less a, than a week. Consider, consider that the day then he was going to kill Kirk, that's the same day they fly to Cuba. They get Which to is Cuba about two and a half hours day. from D.C., isn't it? Mm-hmm. So it's not like it's a 12-hour flight. No. And then that was the same night. The, the next morning is, is in during the night that, that they all come back in. Resser takes a plane and lands there in the morning. Uh, that's the next day. He's not even there at two days. He's, he's the same clothes when he arrives and when he leaves. So that's the same day. And that means that the whole that whole thing that whole episode was one day continues on the, the episode two. 
That's then another day when they land in Nova Scotia, which is only like a, what, five hours, six hours flight. Uh, they and went they, from they, Florida to, to Nova Scotia, but they probably flew yeah. in from Cuba. To, uh, no, no. So maybe, maybe make it a 12 hour, uh, 12 hour flight. You're flying yeah. in the entire length of, of, of the Americas. And so that's another day. It's been probably four days at the most. Yeah. <laughs> and that's from when Tom found out that he was not abandoned as a child. <laughs> so we, we need to touch on that later on that's with Tom true, that's and everything. Days. Yeah. Everything so, he's but been the, the, For everybody, this is very compressed. This is four days, not months for us, days in there. I mean, Cooper is in a bad mood. He's he's going to do his job. His job tells you that you got a uh, FBI asset that has been kidnapped. He's going to get her back now. He's going to get Agnes back. Absolutely. He's he's doing his job, but he is pissed. Oh yeah, and I think that it will event. I think he's been avoiding Liz. I don't think it's the you know the anything else, but he's been avoiding her because when when Tom and Liz were in the post office, it was I guess that was last week's episode. It was a wrestler running point for them and making mm-hmm. the decisions to let them go through things. Cooper was nowhere to be seen. I think Cooper's been avoiding that emotional mm-hmm. discussion with Liz because he spoke at their wedding and then turned around and had to speak at her funeral. That had to just gut him right there. Mm-hmm. And and the fact that he's come to respect Tom and feel bad for Tom, that his wife has just passed, he was left with a newborn, all of that... Turn around, and while I think that Cooper, coming from an intelligence background, can probably understand why the, you know why Tom was doing that, and and maybe even respect it to a degree, I think the fact that he is he is the moral man that he is, I, I think he would feel offended that Tom and Liz did not feel like they could have come to the task force. Now, granted, mm-hmm. I do have a headcanon that, especially after the way Red handled Mr. Kaplan, I, I do have a headcanon that part of the reason they chose to leave the task force out of it was out of fear for what could happen to them. That they understood the risks that were being taken and that they did not want to put Cooper, Wrestler, Samar, and Aron. They were the only ones who were safe. Liz yeah. because it was Liz uh, and, and Tom because, because of Liz. Yeah. And so the the task force could have been put in danger if they had known. And I do think that that probably was at least in the equation. I I would like to think that, that that it was in the equation. And that may just be me wanting to think that, but you never know. All right. So that that lands us straight into the Kings. And a very, very interesting perspective um and we're gonna have to touch a lot of of you know going on the keens we're gonna have to get a bit into canon and theory because i think a lot of 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 the reactions and i know maybe i'm seeing this because i'm not a shipper so i don't have the same kind of emotions however much i like the keens alone uh and, and and together i think that a lot of people are leaving a little bit out of the equation why this thing happened and and how much of of this is Rostov's fault to be what to be fair I have enough emotions for the Keens for both of us so yeah. <laughs> oh, I ship them hard enough for both of us <laughs> okay so it was interesting because when you look back into season one because that's the last time we saw the domestic Keens you know where they did have fights because these two it's not like they never we've never seen them fight before season one they had some pretty nasty you know throat i mean not physical throwdowns they did have those as well but mm-hmm. i'm talking about you know uh verbal you know harsh mm-hmm. harsh words split between them and it was one of the things that i found very interesting is that tom his go-to when he when he argues with someone tends to be to try to spin the argument on its head and go on the offensive and just go after him, go after him, go after him. Sharp words, beat them down until they just can't come back and they don't want to. He just wears them down. When we saw, uh, when when Liz discovered the, the go box in season one and Tom discovered that she discovered that, the fight that they had in the, the argument that they had in the kitchen, 
he's just, she can't get a word in because he's just, his hands are going everywhere and he's yelling and he's screaming. Why would you think that I would do this? You know, what kind of person do you think I am? This is your job. Your job brings us this pain. Your job does this. And just over and over. But that, and was, over. Also, that was also Tom covering up. Oh, that's, that's true. But I'm just saying that's, that's his go-to in arguments. And we've seen that in various points. Uh, he did it with Jolene. Uh, when when they were in his safe house. That was, again, a cover-up. Oh, yeah, and he does that, and that may be the situation, but it also seems to be the way that he argues. Because most of the time when he's arguing, he is covering something. You know, wh whether it's conscious or subconscious, he's still covering. I found it interesting to see that Liz was the one hitting below the belt today, or, you know, on, on Thursday's episode. That she was the one, oh, I'm sorry, was that when you were a skinhead? Because it wasn't when you were an elementary school teacher. It's, she was or basically. Or Berlin thug. Yeah, I yeah. mean, wow. Thug, skinhead, not when you were teaching. She basically took everything that they had, that they have, they have dealt with, they have processed, and that they have overcome, and basically threw all of that hard work out the window and said, so, here you go. I'm pulling all of this up. And, you know, <laughs> everything you have done wrong, I am bringing to your attention again. <laughs> and it's harsh. And you can see the turmoil in his face that he doesn't want to have this argument. And he, he says it one more. He goes, I'm not fighting with you on this. Because he did what he felt like he had to do. He felt like, and this is this is where I'm coming from on this. I, I do a lot of writing for Tom in my my fan fiction and stuff, so I, I tend to get pretty deep into his head. And, you do. And so, I mean, I, I would like to think I know what he's thinking. Sometimes it always depends. I mean, how it comes across on the show. But from what I have seen with him, he we the situation. She came back and almost immediately, while they were being shut out by Red. He and Liz took action, went to the FBI office. They get back. Red decides, okay, I need you for this op. Basically throws him into a, a very dangerous mission that puts his life in danger. That does nothing. And if not nothing, it actually puts Agnes in more danger because and, and whether they knew it or not. And I'm not blaming Red for this. It's not like he did this on purpose. But it actually puts Agnes in more danger because instead of having the virus to fall back on, suddenly Kirk's only option at the moment, as it seems, is Agnes's blood, which well, could kill I, her. And I think that that is a very extreme miscalculation of Red. I think Red is not understanding what Rostov's ultimate objection is objective is what we've got with tom is he's seeing this he's seeing failure after failure after failure his daughter is still missing his wife is freaking out he's freaking out and i don't think he's very good at processing his own emotions either because he has very much stood solid for her and mm -hmm. she has been leaning on him which is great that that's he does that for her and it, it's a great scenario that they have but he has no one to fall back on. He has no one to help him process these emotions. And I'm hoping that we'll get a scene eventually in which Liz realizes this and helps him work through it. And there's some teamwork there, kind of like right before the wedding when she she helped work him down from his, his spiraling moment. But right now, he feels backed into a corner. One thing interesting in, in all that, that you're saying about how Tom feels, you know, that he has nobody is that I noticed one very, very intriguing reaction in Red that feeds straight in there. That was the perfect opportunity for Red to tell Liz, I told you, I told you he was reckless. Yet he didn't. I was shocked and, over that. I was. Oh, I was not. Because <laughs> but I you also got a better handle on Red than I do. And so. <laughs> <laughs> I I found that fascinating because immediately as he saw that I had all this these lines in my head, you know, that Dom telling Red he's she's not she's gone because of choices you made for both of them. Uh, you, I was a Hobson choice that both were gonna die. It was I had to save one or lose both. Red reacted like Tom. Maybe now, 30 years later, he's wiser, he's a better strategizer, all that. But I think that 30 years ago, whenever that choice was that Red took, 
that for for Katerina actually was very similar to this. Which will, be, which will be which will be just another parallel between Tom and Red. <laughs> so Indeed. those keep piling be, up. And then and then that would explain why he doesn't have the heart. Because I think that Red may may not like Tom and but I think Red is fundamentally a a, a fair person and I think that he cannot say well, he did this knowing very well that he did something diff- the same. Well, I, very think that's, similar. I think the fact that he is relatively fair in, in the grand scheme of what he what he is and what he does for a living, the, I think that's one reason why people are so angry about Kaplan, is that that was, many people see that as a very unfair reaction. It was a very emotional reaction. And I think that's the core of it, is that Red typically, when Red said he hasn't killed anybody that doesn't deserve it, I don't entirely believe him on that. But I do think... He believes it, doesn't mean that I do. Exactly. And and people lie to themselves. That's what they do. I mean, everybody's lied to themselves at some point or another to, you know, handle a situation and to come to terms with the situation. But in, in the grand scheme of things, he tends to be fair more or less, towards the mm-hmm. people. And so the fact that he took that extreme reaction with Kaplan, I think that's why a lot of people, maybe not shocked particularly, but angry. Angry, but, shocked, any variation thereof. But but this in this situation, the absence of what Rhett tells is more telling than anything he would have said. Oh, you have to listen just as much to what Red doesn't say as what he says. You really mm-hmm. do. That's something I found in the three plus seasons of The Blacklist and trying to get, trying to come to terms with Red speak. <laughs> yeah, you're going to speak Red fluently. And, and that is, you know, thank God that I can do that. <laughs> I have plenty of experience. But it's, it's very um, it's fascinating because that also, in that scene with Red, um, take us right back into into another uh, parallel, which is when he tells when she, Liz tells Red that he couldn't she couldn't keep her daughter safe. She couldn't tell her it was everything was going to be okay. And I just flash immediately back to the music box. Absolutely. There are so many instances with Red where he talks about that he should have raised her and this and that. And I mean, just these moments there where he you can tell that he just beats himself up that he hasn't been able to keep her safe. He hasn't been able to keep her. He was not able to help her avoid all of this that I think in the grand scheme of things, if he thought he could have, he would have done that in a heartbeat. You know, if giving up his life would have kept Liz safe, I think he would have done it. Safe and out of all of this, but I don't think it would have. And therefore... No, so he, I don't think, if, you do, if you think about it, it doesn't make any sense that Rostov and his need for the for the descendant, it's the reason she's in danger. they got to be something else. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm. And so, but yes, I agree. She, he would have... He would have committed suicide. He would have gone on to the woods and never, ever come back alive. Uh, he would have done anything that he th- felt he had to do to keep the people he loved safe. A lot like Tom. <laughs> yes. And Tom, A man that would burn the world to save the one person that he cares about. Yeah. I, I have very, uh, I think that, that Tom there, I, I just wrote a big thing on I don't think that you can blame, I don't blame Liz, I don't blame Tom. But it, we're to, to, let's talk about Tom. I feel Tom had to do. First, Tom is under no illusion that, uh, that Rostov will not hurt Agnes. I think that Liz may think that she knows, but I don't think Tom is convinced at all. I think think a lot of that comes down to how they were raised. With the way they were raised, the different scenarios, and and I mentioned this several times on Tumblr on on today, which is Friday when we're recording it. You have Tom, who was raised in a scenario. He was in and out of foster care as a kid, a runaway. And he was picked up by the major at 14 years old, is what we think. It's a little iffy on the age. As a child. Yeah, as a child. He was picked up by the major. As a teen. Who told him this, you know, everyone's saying that you can't connect, that there's something wrong with you. I think those things are what's going to make you successful. And manipulated him into becoming what he ended up. 
And But regardless, that was Tom's father figure. Whether Tom admits it, whether Bill McCready admits it, he's the only operative out of the out of the St. Regis program we've seen that calls him Bud. That's that's something that struck me with them is that you don't see Gina calling him Bud. That that is a nickname that Tom uses. So there's a certain closeness. And when when McCready pulled that gun on him, when they're in the car together and he pulls the gun on him, the first time he p- tries to shoot him in the head, you know, mm-hmm. and. Tom raises his hand. He goes, "I'm not just another operative. You raised me." He also had saved uh, yeah, Bud's life. Yeah, he's you know after Kate. Uh, after, Kate down. Yeah, and so that was. There's a lot there, and I'm hoping someday they'll they'll birch that. But regardless, you can tell that he, in, at least in some fashion, that's the only father figure he's ever had, and so he has a father figure that basically taught him, "You're good to me as long as you're useful." The day that your usefulness runs out is the day I put a bullet in your head. That is Tom. Tom's usefulness for him was bringing in money. As soon as he went to the feds, he lost his usefulness and Bud tried to kill him. Liz, her father figure, while we have a bunch of father figures as an adult, her father figure growing up was Sam, which as far as we can tell was a very loving relationship. You assume that it's, you know, I mean, he, he was a bachelor that took her in and, and she was his child. He exactly. raised her as his own. He loved her. He was her whole world, she said at one point. Mm-hmm. And so we have two vastly different upbringings for people that, that have a lot of similarities. But to, this is one point in which they, they are very, very unique from each other in how they were brought up and the way that they view fathers. And the way that you view a father mm-hmm. or the way that you view a parental figure will have to do with your upbringing. There's going to be a lot of subconscious influence on that. From well, that for situation. Tommy, it was obvious that as long that once Rostov that Rostov wanted that child because he needed that child, it was going to if it was about killing, it would he would do because that's his experience. Absolutely, but it's going to because, kill him when he was no use, no longer useful. And it's not that Agnes is not useful to Kirk; it's that her use is to die for him. And so, yes. obviously, from Tom's point of view. A horrible person that is willing to take a child and manipulate a child anyway and use a child like Bud did. I mean, that that's what he grew up with. That of course, I'm sure Kirk's he saw going Bud killing that. one or another that didn't wasn't useful oh. anymore. Oh, I'm sure that Tom sat back and watched a lot of kids die as as a young kid that but that didn't pass the muster of St. Regis. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that he saw a lot of terrible things as a teenager and into adulthood but mm-hmm. and so that's his viewpoint and then you've got Liz who was raised by Sam who you know in the back of her mind this woman that has always wanted to know a little bit more about her past is going but he wants to he wants to love me he wants us to have a loving relationship even if it's twisted even if it's not healthy this is his deepest desire. I, I got such flashbacks to the Jen episode with the way she was describing that to him when they were sitting there. His mm-hmm. fantasy is this. His desire is this. And I'm going, okay, Liz. <laughs> you know? I think that uh, that is thick. a very, very astute observation of yours. I think that when, and I've noticed that, you know, you, I got immense respect for the writers. When they drop these little hints in the way the things are phrased. So if if your immediate thing was the gin, that's probably what you're seeing. Exactly what you're seeing because I I have a a a, a setup in in my head of of this argument and and the reasons for for the Keens' reactions in the way they did. Tom to me made perfect sense. I probably, being Tom, would have done exactly the same thing. I probably would have stopped to think that probably he was trying to that that Kirk was was a bit more more sophisticated than that. But I think that when people are scared, they tend to react and not be the best strategizer. That's what sets Red apart from everything. Well, and he he went to people he trusted who told him. And when when they were about to storm the the house, he goes, are you sure? And he said, yes. The signal comes to this island that led to this house. Your child is in there. I mean, he he was relying on people that he trusted for this. Mm -hmm. And and I I don't I don't blame him. And I, in fact, take a little um, a little bit of a. um, 
uh, exception to the way Liz framed this. This to me was a, a throwback to um, the un, un, unilateral decisions Liz takes for them. Yes. This, this was Liz going straight back to that. So we'll, I'll touch on this later. But this, to him, it was like, this is what we're going to do, okay? And I told you not to do something different. I told you not to do something different. It's not a discussion. It's an order. And that's my issue. Are you okay? And I'm glad you're okay with this. And his face was going, I was never okay with this. When did I ever give you the impression I was okay with this? <laughs> and, and notice that both Red and Tom, who know Liz very well, when she gets into that mindset, they don't even try to reason with her. They know it's absurdly, it, it's, it's, she's going to do whatever she's going to do. Tom told her that in the boat. Red had said, you're going to find, you have to find this out on your own because they know who Liz is. So I think that for Tom, it made perfect sense to do this, um, to do it behind Liz back or not. I think that sometimes, even though you may have the utmost confidence in your in your partner sometimes if you think that they're not being they're not being um they're not taking everything into consideration or their judgment is not sound his first and foremost uh responsibility is happiness well liz said in the car when she was talking to red about it when she was venting to red about it she said you know i i'm this little girl's mother all i want to do is protect her isn't that what a mother's supposed to do and i feel like that's very much where tom's coming from from a father's point of view mm -hmm. is, this is my child i am a covert operative can i not save her you know, I mean, yeah. how many other rescue missions has this man probably been on over his time? How many, you know, mm -hmm. but Bud's people have been hired for all sorts of things. In Dresden, he was investigating a murder. So, I mean, you know that there were good things that they were hired for. It just depends on who's signing the check, if it's a good guy or a bad guy. Bud yeah. didn't care. And so I imagine that Tom's probably rescued several children over the course of his his career and, and not and not this one but and i he can't this one his child the one that means the most to him he feels like he cannot save her no matter how hard he tries and but, that's got to kill him the the other thing is i'm sure that liz is not being um he's doing this and he's not going to argue liz went really below the belt in this one um this was a throwback to the worst of liz um I think that in this case, although I don't blame Liz, I think that Tom, in general, had a better idea. It didn't come out because they are both losing track in the fear for, for Agnes of who it is that they're dealing with. Because they do not have enough information on Rostov. Both, they both think they're coming from one place, but I think that neither one of us know, know enough about, about Rostov. And that takes me to Liz. So if you have anything that you want to say more about Tom, because uh, I probably... Most of the things I think that I was going to weigh on had to do with, with Liz's side and, and how she Let's was viewing on. it versus... Okay. Let's go on. Great. Um... So one of the things with Liz and that I've seen pop up on Tumblr, uh, a couple people have, have mentioned, and I, I thought of when I was watching it, was the parallel between just last week's episode of when she told Wrestler, I promise to trust him. And then this week she said, I just asked you to trust me. And I can see where in Liz's mind, her thoughts are going to the point of, after everything we've been through, I was able to trust you. When I couldn't see you, when your comms went down, I trusted you to do your job, and you did it. And yet you cannot trust me to do my job as a profiler. This is what I do for a living, and you can't trust me. You went behind my back for this. Mm -hmm. And I, I could see terrific. that being her point of view. Now, granted, if you take a look at it, last week... She may not have called in the cavalry. She also did not stop Wrestler from doing so. And so the only reason the, that Tom's cover did not get shattered to pieces was because of his timing walking out the front door. Not because Liz was trusting him. So it's kind of iffy on that. But, you know, she's upset. She's angry. I could see that being her go-to. But also if, that, if that's the case, then we can also circle around to... Tom never said that he was going to sit back and be the good little FBI husband and wait at there home looking over. Go. He never said I promised. 
So and and- it matter. I, I also, I, I, you know, that, that thing of, of, of Liz saying, okay, you trust me or you don't trust me. The trust upon any situation has to depend on how well that person is assessing the situation. And I feel that, that the problem with Liz in this point is that Liz, she said it herself. She said she has narcissistic tendencies. And in this case, she's being hugely narcissistic. And Kirk is using that. Kirk knows somehow how badly she's always wanted a family. I mean, it's most kids that I, I would venture to say most kids that are, have grown up without a parent are at least curious about it. You know, I mean, whether they decide to follow up on it or not is an entirely different situation. But most most of my friends that I've known that are adopted and such, even if they're raised in fantastic homes... They still got the the curiosity. Exactly. They just want to know where they came from. And, you know, sometimes they follow up on it. Sometimes they don't. It just, but that's a, that seems to be from what I've seen in real life to be a very natural sort of curiosity. And so for Kirk to sweep in, knowing that Red hides things from people and say, I have all the answers for you, Masha. I am your father. I love you. I want to give you everything Raymond Reddington will not. He's playing on her and on everything that she can be manipulated on, including, and it was such an interesting comment from Red when Liz told him about the feed and he goes, oh, how cruel. And it yes, really it is. is. Here, here's your child. Would you like to see her? Oh, I can take her away whenever I want. You know, I mean, that well, it was, was just it, Exactly. That, Liz was actually, in my point of view, Liz was developing between her natural uh, and, and somewhat explicable um, narcissism. It's, you know, in her view, it's all about what, um, it's all about what that, that Rostov wants to get to know her. So she thinks he's manipulate, she's manipulating him. Uh, then second, you get the other aspect of it. Rostov loves Agnes, so he's not going to hurt her. Well, Rostov had said that he tends to agree with the doctor, tends to agree. It's not like we're not going to do this. And who is this woman who's pushing him and pushing him? I don't know, because she's obviously not a doctor, because she made the comment that Mm -hmm. the doctor was bound to the Hippocratic Oath. Exactly. But she's not. And so I'm going, who are you? (laughs) Exactly. So whoever is is this, it it means that, that Rostov has other objective in mind. And if you think about it, why would Rostov? who apparently seems to be an operative, seems to be so good at what he does that he actually manages to stay one step away of Red. I do happen to think that he has some sort of eyes or ears in, in the post office. I suspect maybe through a little gift from uh, Elise to Aram. But whatever it is, he's also capable of knowing what Red's going to do. And that takes a lot of knowledge and a lot of of. of uh, of skill. Well, he has a very dangerous place he's coming from, a bit like probably Dembe, if Dembe were to ever turn on Red, and Kaplan, hence one of the reasons that, that Red shot Kaplan, that I think that Kirk knows Red. He knows more than just the facade Red puts up and shows the world. He exactly. knows Raymond. And, and, and more, much more than just simply, oh, you were the guy who had an affair. Oh, Their so relationship much is deeper than all of this. This is not really a, a, um, a casual relationship. Oh, you were having an affair with my wife. I don't think so. They know each other rather well. Oh, absolutely. In my theory, I don't think that he was a, a KGB operator. I think he was an American. I think he is an American. In fact, they have told us so many times that he's not, that that for me was enough. <laughs> To think that, sure, I know you are an American. What was it? Isadra so, said the other day that they could hand us a piece of information. We'll still tell them, no, that's not true. <laughs> that's us. Yeah, with to reason, your fandom. <laughs> yep, with reason to. So I think that, that if you really examine the situation of, of why, because in examining this reaction, you, you could examine, we, we can go ahead and examine this reaction for, for what it is. So Liz gets angry because she thinks that she can manipulate Kirk into doing whatever she wants and keep him uh, near. But all that sh- that she's really doing, it's she is frantic for connection with her daughter. She had not been with her daughter a full day. 
probably the longest she has ever been is on, on no, not even. She wasn't on the plane ride with, with her. So she has not been with her daughter probably more than four hours. And this is key times for her daughter to be bonding with her. I mean, and that's that goes back to season one when they were all talking about her taking time off when they were mm-hmm. ta- when she and Tom were talking about adopting. Yep. When, when the teacher, I don't remember the teacher's name or if they even gave us a name. Oh, but she wow, said, that is a great parallel. Oh, wow, that gives me bomb. <laughs> Surprise parallel. <laughs> yeah, surprise one. But no, I mean, w- with that whole situation with, with them saying, you know, oh, well, those are key moments. Those are key moments when your child will be bonding with you. You have to take time off work. You have to. You and have interesting to. that she was not going to take time off. And now that she really wants to bond with her child. She can't be with her Liz, kid. Exactly. Liz, Liz cannot win. <laughs> I'm sorry, but, Liz. But it's, it's interesting that, that that is what's going on. He's, this is a woman desperate for bonding with her child. That is, you know, that's a maternal instinct. It, it's just kicking in. And, and, and Kirk Rostov is absolutely taking advantage of it. Because that little glimpse of her makes sure that she stays connected. Was, it just talks all the right strings in the heart. Something, something very fascinating uh, that that I noticed when I was doing, because I, I did manage one rewatch today. It's all I got. <laughs> mm-hmm, me so, too. Someone asked me this afternoon, said, you know, how are you doing? You're doing better than you were doing last night. I said, no, I'm in the middle of my rewatch. I'm doing worse. <laughs> you know? But when I was watching it, when Liz is watching the video feed, she calls Tom at one point and says, I'm watching our little girl. It's like she's, it's like watching a baby monitor. It's like she's in the next room. And she's just, it's this, the, the tone she's using, the phrasing, it's just this, look at our little girl, Tom, isn't she gorgeous? Don't you love her? And it's just this, like it would be the most natural thing. And he goes, but she's not in the next room, Liz. Kirk has her. You know, kind of like, hello, reality to, <laughs> to Elizabeth King. It's, Our child I is think, missing. <laughs> and I, I think, think that's that, one of the reasons Tom did what he did is because he's seen this. He's seen these pieces of almost a disconnect from reality. And we've also seen that in the way she's been reacting to the, to, and, and I've wondered if that's how it's meant or if it's just a storytelling sort of way, the way she's reacting to Katarina's uh, journal, the way she pictures her and such. I'm not sure if that's just a good way to get the information across to the, to the audience or if she's sort of hallucinating a little bit and kind I, of I, losing it. I, I think that she is in a bit. Because also, this is bringing her back to a time in her life tremendously traumatic. She's also developing a bit of the Stockholm Syndrome. She's, she's bonding with Kirk. Kirk is offering her stories. He's offering a, a, nice, a much nicer version of the events. I think that Liz is seriously underestimating the situation. Um, and, and this brings me back that Rostov is manipulating Liz. Let's, let's say that he puts a monitor and he, he doesn't actually tell Liz that he's not, she's not supposed to trace it. Not at all. There is no mention of it. She says it's there and you can, and you can look at it anytime you want. It's, it's open. Why would you hand an open feed to your FBI daughter and expect her not to trace it? Exactly. It's such a so, manipulation tactic. Like if it if it was just, you know, Jane Smith off the street that wouldn't know how to trace anything and would not have any way to trace it, that's one thing. But to hand it to your your federal agent daughter with her spy husband. Exactly. You know, it's, of it's, course they're gonna trace she it. She knew he knew that Liz that in, that attempt of Liz of saving him, or did they not attempt? He, she did save him from drowning, if he was indeed drowning. It's definitely a a uh, it was a, a, a good insight into who Liz is. At the end, Liz is a good person, and Liz was desperate. So hooking Liz with this and just telling her, and you know, I, and he had to know that she had the journal that was left for her. We've seen over and over again. We saw it through at least the first two seasons and well into the third, in which the entire, I mean, Liz has called Brad so many, <laughs> so many unkind names over the course. And mm-hmm. one of them that sticks out in my brain is the bane of my existence. And so you have to ask yourself, why would you keep the bane of your existence purposefully keep this man in your life? It's because he has answers to questions that she needs. She mm-hmm. He has answers to questions she hasn't even thought of. And yes. so... 
that as soon as Kirk showed up waving answers around and potential answers, I went, oh my gosh, Liz, don't do the thing. And here she is doing the thing because that's who Liz is. She need where Tom doesn't necessarily need answers to be happy. He, he needs the right now and he needs the future. Liz is very much a past person. But Liz cares much more about her past than Tom ever will. Not, not about her past, but about his own past. And about his roots and where he comes from. And that's one of the reasons I think that Liz will be the one pushing him into Halcyon. Yeah, but, but, but Kirk in, in used this that. case, yes, he knew and he could have very well know when Liz was in there. So I know he knows he's a guy who knows that absolutely Liz is going to be glued to the monitor walking there. He has the he has the answers. He's waving all that and he's telling Liz what. And imagine what he's hearing on the other end. <laughs> the roomie, the roomie last night goes as soon as they started talking about it, she goes, guys. Guys, he can hear you. <laughs> so in that moment, what are we doing? That he's probably hearing that conversation because it's not stupid. He probably set it up so he goes both ways. So now he not only knows where they are, but they, he's hearing them. So they're having this whole conversation. And, and now Liz is telling... I have to stop you because that's an excellent point. He can track it. If they can track it to where he is, he can track it to where they are. They are no longer safe. I nope. hadn't thought about that, but you were, you were absolutely correct on that. He could track it. Exactly. And not only can he track it, but now he's probably listening. So he's listening when Liz says, we cannot track it. You think he didn't think of this? And, we're and, back to and, the Apple man all over again. Yeah. And now what, what is going on now? Kirk now knows exactly what Tom is going to do because anybody listening to the woman say, no, I told you not to do, we're agreeing. And Tom is like, oh, I don't, I think you're underestimating it. Oh, I don't think you're reading this right. But, you know, Liz is like, this is it. We're not doing that. You're going to trust me because I know what it is and I know what he wants. He wants my affection. So I'm going to manipulate that. If Kirk was an, uh, an operative, then he knows what Tom's going to do. He knows and what, what Liz he knows he'll what go Liz to. Is gonna do. He knows what Tom is going to do. And on top of that, he's probably listening to the conversation because now it's a two-way street. And he's probably listening on them. So, perfect. Now, Kirk knows exactly what he's going to do, which is exactly what he was planning on having done. Now, think about it. He has this server. He knows what Tom is going to do. Are there people in that house defending the house and ready to plop everybody who comes in with bullets? No, there is nobody there. Which tells me at this point he had abandoned the idea that he is going to kill Tom because he realized that's not going to serve his purpose. That's going to turn Liz against him. So he miscalculated how much he loved Tom, but now he got it right. So what is the next thing he needs to do? He needs to create a rift between them. And this is what he does. Tom does what he's going to do, d going exactly in the rail that then uh, Rostov has laid for them. And they have a enormous fight. And now Liz is alone. And then she's not telling Red about it because he know she knows that Red is going to tell her that that's a stupid idea. Which is interesting because, and that's where Kirk miscalculated the depth of Red and, and Liz's relationship, I think. I because think so. she she does go, and that's it was really interesting. It reminded me in season one when Liz was questioning Tom, and when when she would find out tidbits and start questioning him more, et cetera, et cetera. She went to Red. She'd always go to Red, and that he was who she leaned on. And whenever there was a rift between she and Tom, and then we had you know various growth between various characters, and then here this massive fight, the first real full out argument that they've had they had a, some some little you know tiffs between them over if they were keeping Agnes or not but there was never a full blown argument there it was just I'm going to try something if it doesn't work out we'll talk about it some more but right now we're done with this conversation but th this argument that they've had with Tom pulling this has been the first real argument they've had since Goodness, season one, maybe even? Well, I mean, unless you count the interrogation on the boat with them shouting at each other, but I'm not sure that really counts. You know, when they're on the same page, it's been the first argument they've had since season one. Mm -hmm. 
And and she went to Red. I've said for a while that I really, I'm a big fan of character growth. As a novelist, as a person that loves writing and has a degree in English literature, I love to see character growth. And I don't feel like Red's grown a great deal. He hasn't, he hasn't changed. He has And so like these little moments that I find in which he's grown, I cling to like crazy. And this is one of them. And you mentioned it earlier, where she goes to him and she says this, and he could put that rift between she and Tom and say, well, I told you this, you know, what do you expect from Tom Keen? Haven't you, you know, I've been telling you this for years. Why have you not been listening to me? I'm the only one for that has answers for you, Lizzie. Come to me, you know. <laughs> and he doesn't. He just lets her vent. And this is a woman who faked her death to get away from him. He has been so upset and so hurt. And yet in her moment of need... He didn't go after the people she loves. He, Even though she's angry at Tom right now, like pissed to high heavens, she's angry at him. Red doesn't go after Tom. He doesn't go after anybody. He just reaches out and takes her hand and gives yeah. her support. And that is character growth for Raymond Reddington. And I love it so much. Like, <laughs> that's <laughs> hence the reason I'm mentioning the parallel. I loved that moment for yeah. the character Especially growth of Red. Especially I, because I, ha- I think that that... That moment in their growth is when, and ultimately, is going to save Red. Because oh, yes. I think, and the reason for for Rostov, the only reason he set that feat is because he needs to create a rift between Liz and Tom, and between Liz and Red. He's doing a very nice job with Red with a journal and with the things he's telling her, and all this is creating, you know, like you you're, you know, you had an affair with my mother, you're obsessed with me, so all these things. Now, there's a little thing that he says that blood is what I need, but it's not what I want. What I want is for us to be together. But that can't happen until Redding turns out of your life. And that, to me, is the key to the entire thing. Rostov offered uh, Scotty to kill Red, and she declined. But I think what he always wanted, and that's what the painting that was delivered to Red says, is I'm going to get Liz to kill you. No, oh, I'm. I, I've heard you mention that before, and especially after this episode, I could see that because I mean, what would be the what, ultimate what, revenge? Absolutely. I mean, especially if the Daddy Gators have been right, and and Red really is her father, and Kirk knows that. I mean, or even if she isn't, is she's someone he loves? Yeah. And, and, and I, I've said for a while that blood does not make family in this show. It doesn't make family anyway, but it, it really doesn't in a show like this. Red. Red loves her like his own. She she is the daughter, whether it's by blood or by choice. It really doesn't matter. She's Katarina's daughter, ergo, he loves her. And if Kirk could somehow manipulate a situation in which the tides were turned, especially if Kirk was the one she shot, and he feels like Red I was don't the think reason. He was. I don't I know if he was, was or not. And, and it be. I know you've watched the fire episode more than I have, and I've watched it quite a few times, so that's <laughs> saying I, something. I probably can say that I've watched so many times, it's probably <laughs> hearing to its obsession. Your better you know, half is worrying about it, isn't it? <laughs> there, probably it's over a hundred times. Um, I've watched those like almost frame by yeah, frame. Yeah, and so what I'm saying is that you have a better grip of it than I do. I mean, I've watched it quite a few times, um, but... I have such trouble with that because every time I watch it, my brain immediately goes, but it may be false because remember what that doctor said, you know? And so I I have a lot of trouble piecing it out. The things Mm -hmm. that have been sticking out to me in that is the, the fact that the, the, the man she called daddy calls her Elizabeth. And so that makes me think whether he is her biological father or not, that that's red because that's, that's been the name that, that Mm -hmm. red calls her. I it just I don't know who the man she shot was, but if it is Kirk that she shot, if it's a big if for him, that would be such a turn of events to have her shoot Red. You know, to to kill Red, like that would be his ultimate triumph. Mm. I think. I think there's there's uh, there. I think it was Red, but it's that's a very complicated theory. So oh, we're gosh, not yes. going to go there. <laughs> Yeah, I I think that that you know that one of the most interesting things about this episode is that this a lot of people are mildly unhappy with it. Even people from all people from theories, they say they got nothing. 
people, the shippers got nothing. I no, um, my my statement was I got nothing, and then they broke my heart double time, and so. I- <laughs> I'm not angry in the fact that I think the writers did something incorrect. I'm angry as a shipper. <laughs> Both yeah, as a but King's was and a Sam- very as a ROM shipper. <laughs> it's a very interesting, it was a very interesting episode. I think There was that, a point uh, to it. There, there was a point to everything they did. They were shuffling alliances. They were situate. they were, it was a setup episode. When I'm writing, there's always a chapter or two that I hate when I'm writing it. Because it's the chapter that sets all the dominoes in place. And that and, next, and, and, that next and chapter, yeah, you knock them over. And it's fantastic. But it's it's also a very... It's a, it has Yes, I think it is a setup. I agree with you entirely. But it's also a lot of character growth in this. There was a lot of character work put into this episode. And, and it, was a, it was a tremendous episode in terms of action. They had this echo terrorist and, you know, the crazy guy with the music and the plants. And, and then he takes, like, like, I don't know, 10 feet of thing from his nose. Yeah, it was, it was a very interesting episode. Have we had any of, the, of those comments that we can uh, read aloud yes. from the questions okay. we have I, been I asked? Gonna, I have a huge note at the bottom of my notes saying, don't forget social media. <laughs> So, we have decided we are going to, as we've mentioned before, this is a learning experience for both of us because neither of us have ever done a podcast before. So, as we're doing things, we're kind of figuring it out as we go. This is our fourth one, and I I think we're, (laughs) we've kind of got a, a rhythm down at this point. We're trying some new things out. One of those is a question of the week. And we're going to pick something every week, and we're on Twitter, Facebook, and tumblr currently and we're going to pick a a question for friday morning from the episode from thursday night and we tend to to record on friday evenings like right now it's it's friday evening so during the day we're going to open up the question from the episode from the night before and allow people to answer it and then you know read those aloud for the for the episode because we love you guys, and we want you to be involved, and it's a lot of fun to, to have you involved and have, you know, your thoughts and your ideas on the podcast. Absolutely. And so the one that we picked today was uh, was actually Tessa's, and it was fantastic, and I loved it, and I said, yay, I'm, I'm glad you chose it. <laughs> and so the question was, why do you think Tom and Liz reacted so differently to the, fe- to the video feed? And... She and I have gone over this in depth uh, during during this episode, but uh, we had several people, both on Tumblr and on Facebook. Well, I can I can read uh, from Tumblr. Chris yes. said, "Experience and understanding." It was Liz' understanding that Kirk wants her to trust him, wants her to have a relationship with her, wants to know her, so he wouldn't do anything to Agnes to jeopardize that. She has this understanding partly because she is, I think, always wanted to believe that her parents didn't just abandon her, that her situation was created by something bigger than all of them. She comes from the experience that Sam loved her and maybe she can't trust everything Reddington says. Experience and understanding. It was Liz's understanding that Kirk wants her to trust him, wants her to have a relationship with her, wants to know her. So he wouldn't do anything to Agnes to jeopardize that. She has this understanding, partly because she's, I think, always wanted to believe her parents didn't just abandon her. Her situation was created by something bigger than them all. She comes from the experience that last Sam loved her, that maybe she can't trust everything Reddington says in regard to who her parents are. Also, as a mother, she will be willing to be patient to look just at her daughter and know she's okay while waiting for plans to pan, to pan out to get her. Whereas Tom is coming from the idea that... Kirk wants Liz for the collection of cells, and in lieu of Liz, she will use Agnes. He's coming from the idea that parents, like Major, use kids and don't think twice about them. Maybe Reddington isn't off about this guy, and therefore the clock is ticking. He's he's, he's seeing a time crunch for Agnes' safety. If the guy doesn't get Liz, both things are unappealing for him. He's seen this guy is willing to kill all of them to get to Liz, including putting Agnes in danger because she was born. He also just came from a mission that didn't yield results, and he's desperate. I think both have reasons, both have fault. Uh, we have Dom over on Facebook that said, Tom is an operative, he understands action, and he feels like he contributes best when he is, phys- when he is physically is doing something. 
Liz, on the other hand, is a profiler, and she is under the impression that Kirk won't do anything to hurt Agnes because she thinks that all Kirk wants is to trust her. Uh, so she's more prone to just do as he asks. She fails to see that what Kirk was actually doing was a form of torture and letting her feel like Agnes was right there but still miles away. I approve of what Tom did, though it did not work out, and I empathize from both of their points of views. Hopefully next week we'll reconcile. Cindy over on Facebook said Liz is a mother. All she had right now was that video feed of Agnes. It was a connection to her baby. She felt winning Kirk's trust was the best solution to, get, to getting Agnes back. Tom, on the other hand, wants to go get Agnes now, not waiting or playing games. He felt he had to protect Agnes by taking a chance to find her. That's fair. Yeah, I, so far, everybody <laughs> feels kind of spot on. Uh, was there another one from Tumblr? I believe there was. I think Blacklister made a yes, lengthy. Yes, of course. Uh, as John said, as John said in the interview, their professional lives lend themselves to different approaches. Tom, as an operative, wants to take action, and this approach cuts him to out of the equation. He can go undercover with Kirk, and he hasn't had the opportunity to observe Liz with Kirk, so he has no way of knowing if Liz's assessment of Kirk desires is correct. There's also the fact that as much as Tom respects Liz, he fears given the possibility that Kirk is a biological father, that her judgment is impaired. He knows firsthand that that genetic connection is a powerful thing, as it was enough to make him change his mind about killing Scotty. Liz is more emotional than he is, and he sees much her past means to her. As for Liz, she's a profiler and confident. Her evaluation of Kirk drives. She has seen firsthand this genuine desire for connection with her. That's a weakness she may be able to exploit. She's smart enough to appreciate the level of intelligence it takes to rival Red, and I th and I knows he's not stupid or naive enough to allow his location to be given away via linking it up himself. I think that is fair, but I think that 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 I, I tend to think that Liz is underestimating Kirk still. Oh, I I tend to <laughs> imagine that I tend to side with I tend to side with Tom that I feel like that that she's well, being Tom, a little they, naive. Then we're going to kill Tom. I mean, how can how can Liz has any idea in her head that Kirk really wants to get to know her and win her approval when he tried to kill her husband? Easily, she's been working with Raymond Reddington, who gutted her husband the first Got moment it. that she met him and killed her father. She understands the complications of that. Granted, uh, I think that Red is a... I think Red genuinely has a better outlook for, <laughs> for Liz. But I can see why Liz would make that connection. The fact that she has, maybe not consciously, but I do think the fact that she has come to accept Red the way she has influences mm -hmm. that it's a fair thing which is ironic because kirk hates red <laughs> but but yeah um nonetheless he was willing to gut tom but not kill him uh, well, he was i don't think he was, Liz, uh, i don't he think Liz knows that he have killed sam if sam had been healthy or I... did he kill sam because sam was i mean i honestly saw a nod between red mm -hmm. and sam See, I, never I don't saw think that. that the killing was was there was a thing they agreed. I disagree with that because Sam multiple times said, I need to talk to my daughter before I die. I'm, I'm dying. They've given me so many, you know, weeks, months. I don't remember off the top of my head to live. But regardless, set amount of time to live. I need to talk to Liz. I need to see Liz. There are things I have to tell her. And Red was very friendly, jovial, joking with him until he said, there are things that I need to tell Liz she deserves to know. And then suddenly Sam was getting a pillow in the face. And with Tom, uh, as far as I know... Can I convince you to watch that scene again and see that little nod? I, I have watched it. I promise you I have. <laughs> I have watched see, it multiple I times since you said that. I see that they pause for a second. There is a little nod and he puts a pillow in his face. I would love to see it. Believe me, I would. I, I go to all... Every time I find a Lisington friend of mine, because they, they tend to be... I find that the people that ship the ships tend to love the guy the most. It's really odd. It's just something I found in, and it's not 100%, but in general, like, I'm a huge Tom fan. I ship Keen Squared. In my experience, Lisingtons tend to be huge Raymond Reddington fans. Keenler fans used to tend to be huge wrestler fans. And so every time I find, you know, a new buddy on Tumblr that's a Lisington fan, I'm like, please, please, 
give me an alternative view of the Sam and Red scene because I don't see it. I, I cannot do. forgive I can't him. say I it. I do. do. I know you do. And I, I would love to see and I'm that, not a but I don't. Support. I know, I know. And I would love to take you on that. I wish I could force myself to believe it, but I don't see the nod that you're talking I, about. That's okay. I mean, that is the beauty of a blacklist. We it can is. see different things. They're doing something right if we can all see all the chaos. I, I do see it perfectly well. I think yeah. that they agreed on that. And I would love one day to get those missing conversations because there are so many in the blacklist. And that's one that I would actually love to see. And, but, Okay, uh, let, let's get back to our I social have media. An idea. We got we got that, off on uh, Cheryl. This is our last one on Facebook. Cheryl said, "Like above, I like. Uh, I think she was assessing and processing uh, what is best in the long run to get Agnes back. Tom is more impulsive right now. I also think he wants to be the one to get his daughter back before Red does." I don't know that that's fair. I don't think that that Tom is in a competition with this. I think that both men actually had been incredibly able to put aside whatever discomfort they may have with being one another. Because I think a lot of people actually overestimate the amount of hate that Red has for Tom. I I don't think it's quite as bad as that. You you have mentioned it before, and this is one thing I'm inclined to agree. (laughs) There are some things you can sway me on. Apparently the nod is not one of them, but there are many things you have swayed me on. And one of them is the fact that Whenever he found out that Tom was Christopher, I feel like something changed with Red. That there was a shift somewhere in there. And I think that somewhere in there he found out he was Christopher. And the, that that changed things for Red. And it also, you know, it he's not going to kill him. I mean, he came to that conclusion a long time ago. Uh, but between the fact finding out he was his friend's son and that Liz is not, you know, that, that Liz has made her decision. You know, she knows who Tom is. She she has been down that road. They've broken apart. They've built back up on the, on the trust issue. And Red's kind of come to terms with that, I think. Well, I also think that, that Red uses a word. It, put aside the wedding thing. Because what, I have my, my own views on the wedding thing. Put aside what he says, the wedding, and go to what he says about the man. And when he talks to Samar on, by the river when, after she's being fired by wrestler, he tells Samar, he has a disregard for Tom Keen that exceeds my own. I don't think a lot of people actually know the meaning of this regard. But it doesn't mean hate. It means that you don't really care at all one way or the other. Exactly. So that is what his real feeling for for Tom is. I think that people get confused because they think it's about when he goes to talk to Liz, it's about the it's about Tom. I think it's about the wedding. Well, I, th- I think that many people many people let their shipping get involved in mm-hmm. that. And, and I say this as a shipper. I mean, to be fair, I, I let my shipping get involved in a lot of things, <laughs> including last night's episode. Pretty, pretty heavily. Uh, but I mean, when, when you're a shipper, if you're a Lissington shipper, then you, m- at least most of my Lissington friends that I have, see Tom and Li- or Tom and Liz's, uh Tom and Red's animosity as a proof positive that he's garbage. Well, no, no, as a rivalry, as a uh, mm. as a oh, you oh, know oh, oh. A sexual partner rivalry of sorts. Ah. Well, I see, you know, to me, the fact that Tom, that Tom was saved by Red from the robbery, mm-hmm. you know, it was so easy for Red just to let the chips fall where they may. They went, oh, he, and it wouldn't have been his he, fault. Nothing. Yes. I he mean, has nothing to do with it. I, I love Tom to death. That was on him. I mean, like, yep. yes, yes, he felt cornered by Red because Red tanked his job. I will say that, and I I applaud Liz for understanding that and calling Red on that. But to be fair, Red never walked up to Tom, put a gun to his head, and said, "You're going to pull a heist with Gina Zena Tacos." This exactly. Is, this should be your go-to. And, and that exa- was all on Tom. I love it, him, but he makes some really crappy decisions every once in a while. <laughs> but this this was something that he didn't have to do. Yet he. He saved him, and he had no objection. He doesn't go to Tom again and tells him you have to leave. He goes to Tom and tells you cannot marry her. Not you cannot live with her, you cannot be in her life, marry her. So the problem is the marriage. 
Yes, I, I thoroughly agree with that. And it'll be very curious moving forward. I, I feel like, and we've talked about this before, that I feel like we're missing major pieces of this puzzle that will yeah. eventually come into view and come into focus for us. Well, one thing I got to say that uh, we saw some some plaid shirts. I need to analyze further the episode. The plaid shirts, I tell you, you know that now I'm beginning to get this, like, whenever I see somebody in the, in the street in a, in a plaid shirt, I'm like, oh my God, they're lying. There's, okay, yeah. so I saw I saw uh, a future a future episode like the uh, the promo pictures. I think it was a ROM and plaid shirt. And I went, no, don't do it a ROM. <laughs> No, you know what that, but remember that it doesn't mean that the wearer is, is lying. It just means that that's it. Yes. In that moment, there is something in that situation is not as it seems. I think and we're notice that at in this one, <laughs> Well, either we're looking at Elise or that episode is about some hacker. So he may be going undercover. Because also remember that when wrestler were going undercover, he was wearing a plaid. That's fair. So um, I'm not going to call her by name because I don't know if she wants me to call her out on this. But she, I have a friend over on Tumblr who she's from over in Europe. And so obviously English is her second language. And she heard us say plaid last week. And she goes, wait, is that how you pronounce it? I didn't know. I thought you pronounced. How do you people spell that? And I said, I'm sorry. I have no excuse for the English language. I know, <laughs> we are I, a bizarre I language. I realized that that's how it was. It was, uh, it was a spell. I'm like, why? Uh, we don't have an excuse. As, as no. an American who has spoken English my entire life, we just, we have no excuse. We're, we're insane. Like, <laughs> English got, got uh, written very late in, in its history. So it's, it's what happens to uh, when it's not spoken by royalty and, and, and the higher classes. It was just the language of the people. Uh, and it, it shifts. Uh, the pronunciation shifts. I have no idea how how uh, the British pronounce it, to be totally honest, because it's not a word that's actually spoken very often. I don't no, know. It's, I see it written checkered. much more. Checkered is, is probably the more, the more, uh, um, uh, the more ancient um, word. But, yes, it's, it's, absol- it's there. Aram is wearing one, and Gaia was wearing one, mm-hmm. and and there is other. Of course, we got water, we got we got instruments because Gaia is playing music. So you, we have a lot of our of our usual suspects in the terms of symbols. It was, God, it was it was a stressful episode for me. I I I am still stressed out over it. But like I said, I am a shipper. I'm looking at it from my. My OTP for the for the show is Keen Squared, but Saram is is my little guilty pleasure over there. I don't talk about it a lot. I don't analyze it a lot because we don't have a lot for it. It's just it's one of the few things that the majority of the fandom seems to agree on is that we want Samar and Ram together. Well, you know, I gotta say something there. I'm not oh, gonna dear. endear me to a lot of people. <laughs> you do not like them together, do you? <laughs> I actually think that no, I'm not. I'm, you know, I'm not a shipper. Whatever the writers give me, as long as they, as they, document it and write it well, I'm happy with it. But just looking at personality wise, I think that Samar and Wrestler come from a, oh, see, in I... many ways are you know two things. Well, Samar is very much in the grace. Wrestler is not. But on the other hand. They both have a more um, a, a work first approach to life. I think that that um, the things that Samar is willing to do for work will not be understandable to to Aram. Oh, I think, I, I think Aram to... needs to be to be beaten up a little bit by life. And I think that's about I don't to happen. Want him to do, I don't want him to do. I, I love know. Aram. Nobody wants our cinnamon roll beaten on, but I if it, if Elise really is a covert operative, Aram's about to get put through the ringer. And I, whether she is or not, I do believe that they're working towards Aram because Bogan Camp has said I don't remember where or when this yes, this I comment the, was, but yeah. he he made the comment at one point. He's like, we want them together. We just don't know how to do it, and then keep going from there. We just like that. That's basically like the end game. Yeah, we for have them, to put but... them with the wrong guy in order to to yeah. then have her with the right guy, and I so put him with the, the wrong right girl, guys. and then suddenly they're together. You know, but regardless, something is going to happen with Elise 
to that's going to throw Aram for a loop. Because- well, I, all I can say is Aram was wearing a plaid shirt <laughs> when Elise was there when he was cooking. So I know. I mean, I that much I know. I can guarantee. You I go back and do a rewatch, and whenever you see a plaid shirt, you know something is not a. You're not this. wrong. I mean, imagine. Remember all the plaid that Tom wore. <laughs> It was like but cardigans and plaid. Cardigans and plaid. That's all Tom wore in season yes, but, one. So they, I, I mean, still I, want I, to I, know what Boken Camp has against plaid and shirts. That is, and that, that is absolutely my... I don't think that anybody else is saying this but me. I don't think so. And you know what? There have been some things that have come across in the series. I'm like, well, that was Tessa's. There we go. <laughs> well... That comes from being a theorist and not a shipper. Oh, uh, you know what? Hey, I, I've made some good calls over the time. Just because I'm a shipper oh does not mean. <laughs> oh no, 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 no! But I'm, what I mean is, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. Um, I'm not biased by yes, that. No, that I think that's entirely that when, true. When and, your when your heartstrings get tugged that way, you don't. You know, there are things that that you that you and you have to. That's why you do them. I mean, you're a writer. You know the what you do. I was gonna say, and to be fair, I spend a lot of time in his head for the fan fiction, and that that is one of the reason. I I'm not sure which came first, the chicken or the egg, the writing or the, <laughs> the shipping, but <laughs> but I definitely know that I started shipping them harder the longer I started writing for them. <laughs> Well, they're, they're they're all exceptionally well written characters. Oh goodness! They're yes. all very very. I, I am happy that now we're we're. I think that last season a lot of people were unhappy, you know, because some characters were not getting adequate uh, time. I think that they, you know, to be fair, they had a plan in uh, in Megan's pregnancy. They threw them off the loop. I, you know, I they, do I agree. Think I think that. it probably threw them potentially a half season off. I, I would think, think they may so. have had to to scrap things for a, for a half season, maybe. I mean, yeah, and that's they, just that's a rough guess. We were but. starting to get the same themes. I think that Liz was going to fake her death, that Liz was going to get pregnant, but probably was going to be done over the 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 season three and season four, and not all jammed in there. Well, I mean, I've heard people talk about the the. Uh, that the Keens arc was a little rushed. And I actually got an ask on Tumblr the other day about this, about it being rushed. And I said, well, let's be fair, television. You know, let, let's not put this in reality. Let's put this in television. It's been two years, let's see, eight months that she was pregnant plus year and a half. T- two two and a half years ish since since they broke up you know that it took them to rebuild everything get to where they are for tv that's that's pretty slow slow burn there <laughs> you know? yeah no i don't think i don't think so i think that they would have gone together then they would she have got pregnant they would have um have her fake her death because i think with 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 katarina walking in the ocean that was bound to happen. I mean, that has been there. Oh, then yeah. you get well, the, the parallel. Well, we go back. There are two Vanessa parallels. Cruz parallel. You you get so many drowning, so many fake death. There's so many of them. Oh, what is it? So, I had a friend on Tumblr the other day, and she ended up posting this. So I don't think she listens to the podcast, but somebody will probably notice it and know who I'm talking about. It. She posts up. She goes, "Was it people in the blacklist just need to die or something like that?" She goes, "No more fake deaths allowed." Oh my God, Mira died. There's been plenty of people who die. I said, but personally, you know, I'm okay with fake deaths when they're people that I want to live. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I well, will the, admit that. The, the fake death is a, is a fundamental thing of the identity. It is. When and, you and, want and to of disappear. the genre. Spies, yes. spies, fake deaths. How many times has James Bond died? <laughs> you know? Exactly. It's, it just goes, because when you need a new identity, the first thing you got to do is die. Yes. Oh, and and that's one of the things that that they do. It's fake death. And Katarina's without a body. That was just begging for Liz to do the same. Oh gosh, yes. Okay, so I think <laughs> I think we, we can wrap that this. Yeah, I was uh, gonna say we've gotten so far off topic. <laughs> um, but hey, they were uh, they were uh, themes. Themes. We were on themes. We do love themes. Themes and parallels. Those are our yeah. bread and butter at this Well, we, this got, we got the water. We got the plaid. We got music. Um, yes. Music as a symbol of, of, Which, of, of, by the way, of loss. Speaking, speaking of music, I am going, you know, on the 
rare, rare chance that this ever gets listened to by somebody on the writing team. I am begging you people, have Ryan sing a lullaby, you know, have Tom sing a lullaby to to Agnes, because for heaven's sakes, Ryan can sing. <laughs> Just please use that. <laughs> I'm dying for that moment. I really, really need to hear, I mean, it's some point for, for Tom to sing. Let's talk about that lullaby that is a freakily scary lullaby. Really? That almost rank right there with that little lullaby when when that's uh, a really traditional lullaby. Is I that... know it is a traditional lullaby, but it is scary. I mean, I it's guess, scary. but nobody gives it a second thought because, like, every child in America was raised on that lullaby. <laughs> mm. See, I wasn't. I know. I, I was going to say this is where we're getting a different a different uh, point of view here. That's why I'm so fascinated now. <laughs> And and it's a it's a it's um you know if if you think about that you know kind of scary lullaby that was during the fire that's about that's, the same thing yeah, of scary that's fair. Uh, well I mean if you think about Ring Around the Rosie it's about the plague in London I mean <laughs> for some I mean, reason people back in the day seem to think kids need to talk about death and destruction and dying and nothing like that to get a good night's sleep I know right go to sleep have <laughs> nightmares kiddo. <laughs> So I think this this mostly wrap up our our um, the fights end up being not about what we have put in there. So it was about Tom going behind Liz, and um, I think that pretty much wraps our yeah podcast for I think so. uh, episode four of season four on NBC The Blacklist. Absolutely, and uh, as we've said before, we're on. We're on SoundCloud, iTunes, and YouTube, and so it's, uh, we're still getting our, our rhythm down for when it gets edited down and posted. We, we do it all ourselves, so it's, you know, nobody's doing it for us, so yay, you know, we, we're getting it, getting it down. Well, that sounds like, like too much, you're doing it. <laughs> I shouldn't take any, any, any for that, you, no. you're the magic behind it. No, you're the one that started this, you don't get out of that. <laughs> By the way, if so, anybody would ever like someone to blame, Tess is the one that goes, hey, should we do a podcast? <laughs> and I went, there you no, go. I have no time. That's amazing. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was funny. That was very funny reaction. I got no time. I got so much stuff. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> that's, that's how no, my life works. No, it wasn't works. Not even that. I, it's, I have like no time. I, I'm so busy. You know that there is this great microphone? I asked a friend of mine and that's like the best thing. <laughs> was that's how it went down it's not a lie yep. <laughs> nope so anyway tune next week for our delinquist concern and if you have not listened to the interview um it's a, a from the director of the next episode it's a fascinating view into the amazing amount of work that comes into creating one of these episodes for us and i think that for all the people uh, particularly shippers who tend to sometimes get a little um, out of hands with the writers, with the production team, with the actors themselves. Take a take a good look at that. It's you know there is so much work, so much love put into this episode, so much passion for what they're creating. I think it that whether you like the episode or you don't like the episode, whether you like where they're going or not, it's a fantastically made series that takes about three times as much effort as any other series. I, I so have it, not had a chance to listen to that, but I, every, a, but a, I, I have watched some of the behind the scenes on the disc for season three, talked a little bit about that, about how much they put into it. And I officially will never gripe if, you know, a photo is switched or some sort of continuity is missed because for heaven's sakes, these people provide movie quality once a week for us. I mean, they, exactly. they are very impressive. The, yeah. the kind it, of stuff that they put into, you just, if you're not in the industry, you don't think about it. And they are, they are incredible. They really are. They put a lot of effort into it and they, they give us top notch results. And it's why they have the ratings that they do. They're very good and, at what and, they do. And, and if you do rewatches and you, and you look at things from, from a fresh perspective, you realize that a lot of the things that uh, people may have complained and dangling ends, they're not such. No. They're actually amazingly tight and deeply plotted. So it, with that note, we have finished, I think, our podcast. 
Yes. And so catch us next week. We will be back. And we're very excited. And I know that I'm speaking for at least <laughs> myself and probably some of the uh, Keen Squared side of the fandom that we're really hoping that the Keens make up and oh, play nice next season. Or next, next episode. Or if you're a Keen 2 fan, don't you worry. Things will get better. <laughs> yes. Positive outlook, guys. They're okay. They have been. They have spent the entire back half of season three and front half so far of season four cementing how strong these two are together and how much awesome support I got, they provide. I got words for There's that. Reason. I got even better reasons for that. They're drawing parallels between Tom and Red. Yes. That's and, all I got to say. Katarina and Liz. That whole relationship, they're parallels. And Katarina and, Re- and Tom. So these are, these are two people... For two couples or two I, we have no idea if Red and Katarina were a couple I gotta say we do, really do not know but they're drawing parallels so people stay strong <laughs> they're getting back and this comes from the non-shipper the shipper also exactly. says stay strong <laughs> I do love I do love the Keens and I, I've always said that I'm not a shipper but I think that the Keens embody together apart and together everything that the blacklist is about they have every single one of the themes of the blacklist. So to me, it makes perfect sense. And I'm not a shipper. All right, guys. Well, we appreciate every one of you. Please feel free to leave us comments and ratings. If you love us, we would love to hear about it. I know that I've actually had several people over on fanfiction.net say you guys are listening. I'm looking at you. Please let us know that you're listening because I'd love to hear from you guys. It's amazing to see how many different parts of the internet you're coming from. Yes. Because we're, we're watching the numbers climb and it's awesome. It's really exciting. <laughs> so. Yes, indeed. And also um, have questions sent if you, because once we hit the hiatus after uh, episode eight, we are going to go and dig into the real tough questions, the real tough episodes and scenes of the Keens. Absolutely. And I, I will say that I would love personally, and I'm going to try to reach out to friends between now and then and uh, of various different ships. I, as much as I dislike the, the anti-culture that, is so prevalent in social media right now. I do want those people that are frustrated with Tom that, that don't like him. I want them to pose those questions to us so that we can try to have a dialogue. Uh, it just, yeah, I feel like a lot not, of, not, I hate Tom. Well, absolutely. I mean, yes, that's not I, a question. I, a question looking, generally have a, a question mark at the end. We're, we're looking for a dialogue here. We're looking for a chance because there are so many times that we see, well, nobody talks about this. We do. It's just not that you're hearing us and, and it's because we're just not crossing paths. So we want, Tessa and I want to take a few moments over the hiatus and really delve into those in, in a very deep sort of fashion. And we don't want to gloss over the, the moments that, that the Keens are acting incorrectly. There are plenty of times that they've made mistakes and there are plenty of times that they have have done wrong both to each other and to others around them etc etc we don't want to gloss over that we want to approach those in a balanced fashion and so whether you're a keen squared shipper a keenler shipper a lisington shipper or you don't ship at all we want to hear what you want us to go over and those tough questions because that that really is would be a fascinating way to spend the hiatus exactly so until next episode Yes. Thank you so much, guys. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.